Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ventures. I'm excited about this episode with Alex Ginokoulis. He is someone who I admire greatly. He went from startup land to angel investing to VC to back to startup land. And his new venture, IV, which stands for In Vehicle Experience Enhanced, is off to an amazing start. So we talk about not only his journey through these different stages of his life, but what he's learned from being an angel investor in VC to how to lead, how to grow his new startup. And so this podcast, we talk a lot about how to grow a business, how to think about ideation, how to build a team, how to just go through the gauntlet of navigating investors. And so we talk about a variety of topics. I'm excited to share his startup with you. I'm excited to share his insight going through these different many stages, which is actually quite unique. You know, a lot, not a lot of VCs jump back into the founder game. And so we have a lot to learn from Alex. So if you're watching this episode, you can also listen anywhere that you get your podcasts. You can just search for ventures. And if you're listening, you can also visit wclittle.com to watch, and there you'll see more extensive show notes to the things that we talk about today. So with that, please enjoy this conversation with Alex Ginokoulis. All right, Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks, Will. Pleasure to be here. I'm excited about this conversation for a whole variety of reasons. I really enjoyed meeting, you know, we met probably in the, the, the mid 2010s. Angel investor turned venture capitalist turned just extremely generous, uh, experienced, savvy friend, entrepreneur, colleague. And I've thoroughly enjoyed watching your career over the last five, six, seven years here. Would you mind just starting and telling us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what, what, what you've been up to lately? Yeah, first, um, feelings are mutual. You took that same intro and throw it back at yourself. I think that's the right description of yourself, too. And Pleasure, pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, my background. So out, out of college, I had the startup bug. Um, went on to a startup, um, was there for six years. That company exited to a public listed competitor. And that was the first VC backed company I was a part of. And second company I founded on my own, did that for seven years. It was a sales and consulting agency, sold it to a telecom company. Um, and then my third round here as a, as a, as an entrepreneur was I, I went and helped a friend turn around his company and sell it. And those, those three exits got me um, uh, a fair exposure in you know, creating companies and, and, uh, and, and taking that value and monetizing it. My background was sales, marketing, business development at those companies and taking early stage companies and products to market. Um, then I went in and thought, hey, what's next? Hey, go angel invest, right? <clears throat> Did some angel investments and then uh, a friend, called and had some interest from Middle East investors to create a, uh, a venture fund. And that was Graphene Ventures. Um, and Graphene Ventures invested in the late stage uh, first. So we did several placements in Snapchat and Lyft in their Ooh, series uh, EFG rounds, kind of <laughs> really late. Yeah. And then we did an early stage fund, uh, series A and C. Um, after six investments at the early stage company, the, um, at the early stage rounds, I, the entrepreneur in me was still calling out. Like I was just about to turn 40 and I just felt like I got another one or two of these in me. And the siren that was singing kind of on the shores was that the mobility as a service industry really caught my attention. That there aren't many three trillion, there aren't many trillion dollar markets and, mm. and mobility is a three trillion dollar market. Mm. When you start to look at like, you know, Apple and Google wanting to get into the space with autonomous driving, right? It, it, it's primarily because it's six times bigger than the mobile phone industry. Mm. Like, and, and, and what I was seeing, like aside from like the size of the market was like, well, essentially what was being built with, with ride hailing companies um, was the fast and cheap networks, right? And like from my mobile phone right now, I want this and I want it in three minutes. I want it in five minutes. And that's good, right? But they'll, but if you keep going, you'll always be competing on price. There'll be a faster, cheaper ride that'll get there and that will start to look like public transportation. And there's gotta be a flip side to that coin. 
there's got to be a value of that relationship with that passenger or the, the uh, amount of time that passenger spends either on your network or in your app. And so what kept, kind of kept calling is kind of what does that better user experience look like? And uh, that's why we went out and created Ivy. Um, Ivy stands for in vehicle experience enhanced. And we started first with the user experience in the vehicle. And we started thinking that as kind of creating a better ride. Um, so that's my journey. That's where I'm at today, three years into finding, founding Ivy. And uh, you know, many chapters to be written. <laughs> yeah, nice. So playing the startup game, then playing the venture capital game, then coming back and playing the startup game, what did you notice or what did you do differently starting up Ivy? Like what, what, did, what, what sort of things did you learn from your past that definitely carried forward as you were now start, starting this new venture? Yeah, it was really good. Um, I think you know the thing that I started seeing as an angel investor and Anna Graphene was kind of like the the macro uh, view of what is the business that you're building. Like in the first 15 years of my career, right, it was about taking existing businesses or taking you know mid-sized businesses and kind of growing them. But when you looked at it from an angel investor or a, or a venture capitalist, it was like, like, what's the macro story? Right, and sort of thinking macro and then, and then going micro. That was one thing that helped. The other part was like sitting on the side of the table as an investor, there were certain key things that you were looking at um, from you know, founding team, problem being solved, uh, route to market, um, and then the, the, the cap table. That part I wasn't as familiar with prior, prior to that. So that. That helped a lot in, in kind of like helping me ideate. I got some good... Like for example, I got some good feedback from another venture capitalist that said, you know, take six months before you write your first line of code. Right? And basically saying like, do all the um, customer development, right? The research, uh, use tools that are really efficient to create what is the product and testing out the product before you go out and like just kind of do a whole bunch of keystrokes off of it. And if, if for nothing else, right? There's a big value in being capital efficient and doing that way. Engineers are expensive. Mm -hmm. right? And if you're not writing the right thing, you, you know, you're capital inefficient. Those are some of them at the beginning. At the later stage, I would say when I went to raise money, okay, I knew how to target better, right? I knew who who really invests in what they say they invest in. And I knew <laughs> like who to call, who who not to call, who to, who not to waste time with. Yeah. I think one thing I heard from, from a founder was like, you know, they wish in their series, their seed round. They didn't reach out to 300 people, mm. right? Like there's just somewhere where you just target better. And then, so that's, that's been helpful. Mm. Um, yeah. And then I can go on to more. There's other stuff around, you know, once you raise money or when you're about to raise money, like how to structure that. But yeah. Well, let, let's talk a little bit more about that targeting because a lot of founders listening in are in the process of raising money or just curious about how the process works. Mm. And there is definitely a... Uh, advice, uh, cultural tide, standard amongst founders to, yeah, go reach out to those 300 investors, you know, and it's just everybody says you're going to get, you know, a thousand no's or whatever. And just you got to get expected to hear no, 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 no. But it's a numbers game. And that's that is the common mentality out there. How, how, how I'm intrigued by by what you're saying here. And I think I generally agree. How, how would you advise founders to think about the the, the targeting? Yeah, I got the same piece of advice that, you know, um, seed round, you're going to, you're going to need a hundred, um, you know, a hundred touches, a uh, hundred people that you reach out to and you hope to get about five, right? So, you know, that 95% rejection rate, I don't think a lot of people are built for. I don't think that number is inaccurate. I think, I think the thing to think about is just kind of like, it doesn't need to be 300, right? Or the process to find the right person at those firms. That's some of the stuff I, I would do about targeting. Mm. But before I talk to you about the targeting part, though, like maybe some higher level stuff around like dispelling some things yeah. about, about raising money, right? And like venture funding is not the panacea, right? And so a few things to kind of think about is like, it really needs to be a massive business, right? Like I think, you know, five years to be a hundred million dollar business. Okay, can, you, can that really be possible? Can it be a billion dollar opportunity? Like really ask yourself if that's the business you're building. And if not, then VC might not, might not be the right route. And, and that's okay, right? There's, that, is, that is not the majority of the way people get financed. So I, I think about that first. I think about the capital. Second thing I think about is like capital is very competitive, right? Like you're going up, not against people in your industry, but 
you know, the thousands of other companies that are pitching those same companies. So be prepared to be competitive. Like, why are you exceptional? Why is your firm exceptional? Um, you know, VCs are, the third thing I'd say is VCs are much more risk averse than you think. Yeah. I think everyone's like, oh, they're risk capital investors. But at the end of the day, they're still investors. So they're, you know, they're, they're risk averse. Um, fourth thing, psychology to selling. Like yeah. there's a way to sell, like this FOMO thing, right? Like it is a thing. Like your lead, I oh, will wait for a lead investor. Okay, or oh, this lead investor needs to have this or doing a group round. Um, and the last thing is, is VCs are not dot, 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 dot. You fill in the blank. And there's a lot of things in there, right? That, that, I mean, like, you know, they're not domain experts, right? They're not so contrarian, right? And, and I don't mean everybody, mm. right? There are, there are top players in any field, and then there's others. And those others are an associate that's just coming on, a mid-level partner that's feeling themselves out, right? So, so I, what I say with that is don't think that someone's feedback, the 95% that say no, it doesn't mean that your business is bad, right? So. Okay, with that in mind, I like targeting. Um, yeah, certainly domain expert and stage I'd filter by, make sure that's right. Then, then I'd filter by the right person at that firm. And that part is a little tougher, mm. right? Like, oh, you're selling, you're going into Sequoia. Okay, maybe it's too early, but if you went into Sequoia, who at Sequoia do you go into? Some founders that do this really well, John Rinaldi, I'll call him out from Geobit. He did this really well. He'd go through and say, here's my target list of companies and specifically these people. And then who do you know? And he'd gather from his investor base or his friends or refer founder network. Who do you know? And then he'd take the best intro to get into them. Mm. So like, it's kind of like that, that three-tier filtering. And I don't know how you do this aside from like just kind of researching. There are people that say they are ex-investors. And then there are people that actually are those investors. Right. Right? Oh, yeah, we do early stage all the time. No, you don't. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> we invest in great teams. No, actually, everything you've invested in is a product that's gone out tomorrow. Right? Um, so I don't, know how you, I don't know how you do that well, Will, but you, you muscle memory of reading through, you know, either their blog posts or stuff that they do online. And then founder networks. Founders will tell you who's really additive. I mean, you know. They're the yeah. best sorts of training. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for you then starting Ivy, what what did the the early what did those early validation uh, journey look like for you? Like how did how did you know that this was something that you're going to continue to invest your time and money and rally you know investors and team behind? How how did you go through that that gauntlet? Lots of mistakes. <laughs> I mean, like product experiments that failed, approaches that were totally wrong, right? And then you just kind of keep going. And yeah. the first thing we started thinking about, we were really inspired, I was really inspired by to Toyota has a really, uh, Toyota at CES in 2018, put out this e-pallet concept. And it's really wonderful, right? It's this electric vehicle that uh, it looks like a skateboard. And on top of it, you put a parcel that looks like a vehicle, but it actually looks like any form factor we can put on. So they, they have a, a vision of, you know, uh, a restaurant on wheels, a retail shoe store on wheels, um, an office on wheels. And they have this thing where like the e-pallet will put on these different form functions on the, onto, the, onto the pallet and deliver that experience out to people. I was amazed by that. You know, your coffee shop will arrive in the morning. On your way home, your spa will take you home, um, you know, and the, and the vehicle will become a third space. Like that was just mind blowing. So for product, we went out and got a fleet of vehicles and started putting things into the vehicle that were both digital and physical to test out what resonated, thinking that we could get a really high price per, per ride for that experience, starting to build the experience layer holistically into the vehicle. And what we found was that the market pricing for that from either passengers or brands, that, that wasn't at the price point we wanted. Like we had done consumer research digitally and they had said, well, 35% said they'd be willing to pay more for this type of ride. It's great. And the price point was not where we needed it to be. Okay, cool. Now what do you do? Um, feedback from a founder was, look, this is kind of you know, humbling, but do the simplest thing you could do that could scale, even if it's really not your end product. 
that's tough as a product builder to be like, oh, you know that it's a level six experience when you want to deliver a level 11, right? Like that gap um, led us to do just start with the tablet in the vehicle, create a digital experience that can be dynamic, and then you can do things that can scale up with other, with bigger players, right? People that can do the vehicle changing uh, or a brand supporting you or an opera, uh, operator like Uber and Lyft helping construct that experience. But start with the simplest thing you can do. And um, that's where we've landed. We've started with just putting a tablet in the vehicle and creating a better experience for the passenger first. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of experiments to get to that point. <laughs> So tell us more about the specifics. Where where it's where where is it at now? What is that experience? Who who are you working with? Who are you looking for to to you know the next? What does this summer look like? What does the fall look like in terms of kind of where you're heading? Oh, okay, a lot of stuff. Um, so we're in three years into our journey. Um, we have put in this. Uh, we call it an IV inside. So the the technology that sits in the vehicle today is a, is a tablet that's dynamic. Um, from the content that could surface um, that becomes intelligent um, and that is passenger centric. So if you wish to interact with it, if you wish to personalize that ride, um, we, we empower that. Um, and eventually what that will be is, you know, your ride will become as relaxing as a spa, as entertaining as a theater and as productive as a work environment. So these are the different use cases that can go into that. That's great. Yeah. Uh, we're closing in on a hundred thousand rides that we've done. Um, and so the product is built and tested and we have the route to market to get into Uber and Lyft vehicles and put those on. And so that part we've built up. Um, we've raised uh, outside of eight, outside of uh, family money, we put in, uh, so Angels uh, came in, in in August of last year. And so we are now going out to do our institutional seed round. Um, what that will give us, uh, we've got a good validation from a few partners. Uh, one is a ride hailing operator, uh, two OEMs, car manufacturers, luxury car manufacturers, um, and a few brands that want to participate. So the financing gets us um, the millions of rides that we want to be able to do to prove out more of a product market fit, that passengers um, want to interact with the, the, the technology and eventually want to reserve it. I mean, one way to kind of think about it is, the car is perhaps the last non-smart surface that's out there. You've got a smart watch, you've got a smart speaker, you've got a smart thermostat. When does that vehicle become very intelligent for you? It knows things about you and where you're going and becomes a companion screen or device complementing your phone. Um, that's what we get out of the seed financing. Um, yeah, then those timelines are you know, 12 to 18 months uh, to getting to these millions of rides and uh, proving out monetization. So those those 100,000 rides that you're closing in on, uh, we're, we're done on what what vehicles? Yeah, we put them into um, Lyft and Uber uh, vehicles. We started first in, um, in Los Angeles. Uh, the pandemic hit. We pulled out operations for nine months and then launched again in Miami. Um, and they're, they're passenger vehicles that uh, you know, drivers can, uh, can bring in. So they're eco-friendly vehicles. Uh, get paid the most with IV uh, inside. And are they on your balance sheet? Like, are, do you own these or your? Well, no, no. The first, the first six were on our balance sheet, and then part of that pivot was like, look, we don't want to have a really controlled uh, experience that people that has a really high price point. We want to be able to do something wider market that can scale. Okay, now you can put these into you know thousands and tens of thousands of vehicles, um, and and start with a tablet. Um, yeah, the other thing that's come out of it is like in, in terms of creating a better user experience, all of the um, all of the logic that powers that ride experience uh, sits in a cloud, and and that cloud capability for personalization can then scale out to a phone as well. So we're looking at ways where, hey, when you're not in the in the ride, how else can we personalize your passenger experience? How can some of the contextual recommendations? Um, how can how can some of the content um, and you know, how can some of the rewards be put into your handset when whenever you're traveling? Um, and that gives us a lot of scale, right? So collect data points inside of the ride, right? And then push that out to uh, you know, millions of handsets. Um, that's something we really weren't thinking about when we started. 
right? We kind of were thinking really deeply just into the ride. And what's come out from good feedback is like, hey, you have all the intelligence in the cloud. Your endpoint doesn't just have to be a vehicle. Um, so that, that's exciting. That's something we're, you know, as part of our fundraise, you know, starting the R&D efforts on. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, no, a couple of things come to mind, right? I, we've all ridden in those taxis that have the the TVs or whatever in them. And it's always, it's always just like, ah, how do you turn that thing off? <laughs> yeah. And then, oh, yeah. I, I hate that product. I hate that yeah. product because it caters to the wrong stakeholder. It caters to the advertiser. They purposely call it a captive audience. That sounds like a hostage to me. Mm. And so if you just flip flip it and say, okay, if the technology in the vehicle can cater to a different stakeholder, the passenger. What does that product look like? Mm. You solve something for that passenger. So now you're spinning it so that like it's a complementary device. For example, Will, like your applications running on your phone should be passed into the vehicle so that your Netflix or your Spotify right come into the vehicle and it becomes more like your your content sequences. Right? How do you start your day? What are the stuff that you're putting in there that you can now use that time better? Why aren't you doing a Zoom meeting on the go so you can continue to Slack and send off messages while you're still participating? Those are the things when you look at it from a passenger perspective, you look at the stakeholder, a different stakeholder. Now it's a much different product, right? Like, yeah. And there's still room for, you can still do um, thoughtful sponsorship. You, know, you can still do uh, contextual commerce, right? But it's, 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 it's an invited guest. It's not a uh, like blaring in your face horrible piece of tech <laughs> so so for those of us who haven't i actually haven't been one of those hundred thousand so for those of us who aren't familiar with the experience what what is it right now like if, if somebody's going to be the one hundred thousandth ride what 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 of everything of the paint the uh, picture you just painted what what is available right now let's say if you're miami yep so you'd come in and think of it more like in-flight entertainment you come into the vehicle there's a tablet there it has certain content choices if you wish to participate it's there if not Nothing happens. Do you just um, randomly get it, or is it something you're specific? Yeah, today's for? Yeah, this is part of my part earlier where I was like, you know, the way that you scale up is you start to have some of these partnerships, right? And one of the partnerships is is with ride hailing provider, right? And start to say, look, people are interacting, and you have a chance to either unify an experience or improve that experience, and we're giving you the way, you know, to be able to do that. Um, so the content that's on there, um, so we've created what we call ride modes. So you come in and you say, hey, I want to relax, I want to work, I want to be entertained, right? And those then have a stream of content underneath that. If you don't choose to interact, nothing's there for you. Um, and in a few weeks, we'll be um, announcing that we'll have a voice assistant in the vehicle. So you don't have to, we've been beta testing this um, last year, but you come in the vehicle and you can, you can talk to it. So some of the things that we had found in our testing was music was very popular using Ivy. You'd come in, and you want to listen to music off of our off our tablet. It's kind of weird to me because I was like, everyone would say, oh, the phone. Everyone's just going to use their phone, right? It's your most personalized device. And yet people were interacting at the rate about 20% of the time people got in that they'd interact with the music. Okay, so what we found from product development is can we make it so that it's easier to get to your music choices? Like tapping to get to an artist, that's going to take forever. Right? Mm -hmm. And registering your Spotify to come into the vehicle will take you even further. So voice is that bridge. Mm -hmm. So what, what you'll be seeing in, in Miami in June will be, hey, Ivy, play hip hop. Hey, Ivy, play tra Travis Scott. Hey, Ivy, play news. Right? And so now you have a, a HMI that is you know, faster mm -hmm. and now open, uh, you know, again, a passenger centric experience. And apologies if I missed this, but in order to do an Ivy ride, how do you, is it, do you, is it Lyft or Uber or do you have to, call, like, how do you do an Ivy ride? Today, surprise and delight on Lyft or Uber in markets that we operate in. Um, so we'd love, where you're going is I love, right? So what we're trying to prove out is, can we have, can we demonstrate enough value that people want to reserve these rides? So inside of them, we have an option for you to sign up, right? And, and, and request this ride in the future and build a user base. And then we're looking at getting that also online to say, hey, this is the overview of our product. If you like it, you know, please sign up and build consumer demand. Like, um, so that's that's helpful. We hadn't been thinking, you know, about registering the user essentially uh, in, until COVID hit. So mm. thinking about like, getting into personalizing that experience. Got it. All right. So you might just if you're 
doing a ride hail in Miami, you might just randomly get an IV and you'd be like, oh, cool. What's, what's this, you know? And nice. So then are there partnerships? So that experience then where, you know, you can, with the music and with the other, um, I'd imagine those customers are kind of like, whoa, what's this? Well, tell me more about Ivy. Or are there are there partnerships that you currently have that are in those experiences right now? Or or, or, what, or what does that look like? We've run part, we, uh, so we've run campaigns here. You can kind of think about, um, you know, figuring out what is working and resonating with passengers. Um, so, you know, we've had HBO and Fandango content. We've had uh, American Greetings uh, done an activation with us. Um, we had done Groupon and, and Drizzly, so contextual commerce. And so proving those out to show to partners like, hey, this is, this is a place where you can add value without bump, bump, being, you know, bombarding the passenger. There are others around this fundraise that we'll talk about publicly, but um, those are the ones that we have. You know, yeah. Cased. Yeah, cool. Um, so then two, the luxury, two luxury OEMs that hopefully end of year I'll be able to talk oh, about. Oh, sweet. Sweet. So leadership is leadership is ridiculously hard. You know, I, I think in my 20s, I used to think it was easy, you know, just sort of optimistically go off and doing it. Maybe I was just clueless about how terrible I was at it in various aspects. But how are you now going through the journey that you've gone through? How are you reflecting on your own leadership style and how, how are you evolving that? And how, sort of how what, what are you learning about yourself with regard to leadership in your current company? all the little things mm. like that's the thing that i think but when i was when i was coming up right so i was in smaller environments where individual performance mattered a lot you didn't have a whole bunch of guidance from the top go out and do and if you were successful on the sales side your numbers would show right so and then when you had a team right you managed a bit of the team but gave them self-empowerment and they would just do you recruit well lately what i've realized is all the little things matter. And what I mean by that is like um, the routines to per, uh, create excellence that would otherwise in the past, in my early 20s, my restless 20s, I guess, seem just mundane, right? Seem like, or like, or something a big corp would do that just seemed like wasted, right? Like one-on-ones, all hand calls, right? Uh, preparing a, a strategy deck and refining it until it's perfect. Like, like defining the product down to like the nth degree just felt like, man, it's, it's too meticulous. It's too, right? What I've learned now, right, is like those little things are the ones that build up to the final, you know, form of excellence, whatever that is. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm more focused on getting kind of like, what are the little things that we do on a routine basis that define our excellence? Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, setting examples of, being on time and not having sloppy work, like you take that for granted, right? Like you have to reinforce that into your team, right? Like by starting with you, right? Like <laughs> the founder doesn't get a pass. Like you can't always be like, oh, hey, I'm late cuz, right? No, everyone's time matters. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's good. And I think, you know, we were talking before we hit record about the, the the fundraising process and some some pitfalls that are that 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 are common that unfortunately founders keep falling into over and over again and and frankly venture capitalists maybe they're well meaning when they get into it but maybe similar they they've been VCs for so long that they get into some behaviors that maybe are 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 less than helpful for humanity what what's what's the what's the frank advice for founders coming in? You know what? what how, how would you na- help them um, navigate the process of where to get resources and what are the main things to watch out for when when raising, especially from institutional VC? Hmm. Um, I think the biggest thing to think about is that you and your team, right? That's the core, and continue to build uh, like. Never stop building value at at high pace. Um, so start with that. Just kind of like that's what you can control. That's what's in your real house. Okay. Now then, look at the investors, and this is kind of what we were talking about on the on the call that maybe founders prior to starting the call, founders may not know about that. You sometimes you get into perverse in, incentives. Uh, VCs want um, all investors, right? They want a really high return. 
and they want as much of that company as possible. Sometimes those things are misaligned with the founder. Mm. Okay, so again, go back to what you can control because if you can continue to demonstrate growth and a lot of value, you control, you can be in a better control of, of, of your cap table and the outcome of your company. Sometimes what happens if you have familiarity, right? I have this investor that's invested in me since the beginning, knows me really well. They're on my board. They've been an, ad, they've been an ally for me for a very long time. But there are these points where you need more money. And what you got to think about is that even that best ally is technically can be an adversary at a financing event. You hope not, but it may come down to that. And I don't want to get into, oh, I mean, I can, but like r- roughly that could mean things like the term sheet given to you is 30 days before you run out of cash from some of your best investors with a cold stone look on his face. It's take it or leave it. Mm. And, and I know this from experience from another founder that it was either shut down the company or in, in 30 to 60 days of cash that they had left to, to run and get another set of investors and run an investment process outside of that. And so, you know, that's where I kind of think about keep growing and building your company and then be thinking that every time you go to get another round of financing, you're looking at everyone at the table as if they're brand new people. And so don't, don't lean on familiarity. Oh, so and so promised, or will be there, and that's okay. Um, until the ink is dry, until the, the term. So, you know, that's some of the perverse incentives that could lead to vulture financing that nobody wants to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's level eight, nine, ten advice right there. The first seven levels: go read Brad Feld's book, Venture Deals get involved with your angel, your your startup community and just start talking with active angels and active VCs just about what they do and how, and how it works. Before you're in a position where you need to go raise money, the more homework you can do, the better. Because I definitely know that if you're a founder who doesn't know how to at least talk the talk, it does hinder your ability to, to, to raise money. And so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Do you have any other advice for people even going from level one to seven? Advice. Well, let's, let's so, so in the pre-show, we we're kind of chatting about this, just kind of like comparing scar tissue. But um, <laughs> a few investors had told me when I was fundraising that they uh, they're really good at X, Y, and cleaning up cap tables. And and to someone who doesn't know what that means, you're kind of like, oh, that sounds good, right? It's clean. It's, it's you provide some structure. And maybe maybe that's part of it. But the other part is basically saying everyone that came before is going to get diluted. We're going to get the terms that I'm giving them. Mm. And that also could mean, obviously, that should that may also mean your your own equity as a founder and your founding team. But but I have trouble like looking at the investors that I that did my angel round, right? Did my seed round and be like, yeah, I'm sorry, you're just gonna get diluted down. So one of the things I did at Ivy is like I put my own cash in first. Right. So that, you know, that like, hey, that you're on the investor cap table, too, so that it's not just a, a management um, you know, earn out that you can get. Um, so be wary of that. And, you know, cleaning up cap tables means like, hey, if you take the end, I don't know, I'm not going to name them, take the top five VCs money, they come with strings attached. Yeah, I think the other thing to think about as a founder is there is this naivety, naivete around like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that cash came with strings attached <laughs> since the dawn of time. It's not that the VCs are the problem, right? Financing comes with strings attached. Yeah. You, you know, if it's a loan shark or a bank, right? Like right. they own your house. You don't own your house, right? Like right. you're just paying the mortgage. Right? So kind of be thinking about that. I don't mean to paint that industry as negative. That's not the point, right? Yeah. The, the point is control your cap table by building value and growing fast. And if you do that, you have many options. And if you don't do that and you lean on familiarity, the ugly stuff can, can, can creep in. So a lot of entrepreneurs listening in, I get this question a lot around the, when do I leave the day job? Um, as, as you think about advising founders, that, you know, maybe they're at their corporate job, maybe they think they have an idea, maybe they really want to quit the job and raise a bunch of money and they, they, they don't even... They don't even know necessarily how to ask how to, how to navigate that process themselves, and they often don't have somebody who's been in the game to ask. So I'm asking you, what is your advice for for the 
for those people that are thinking about venturing into startup land, how, how, to, how to think about it? What are different heuristics? What, what, what are your thoughts? You can, you can only swim when, you're, when your feet are off the shore, right? I mean, that, like that. Mm. It's just, you know. Now, there's a pra practical part about like, hey, I need to pay my X, Y, Z obligations. And that, that's real. I, like, I, take that, I don't take that for granted. That's a really yeah. big thing. Yeah. Um, I guess the thing I would just kind of think about is what are the, I think macro, right? What are the proof points you would need to prove to yourself that says, this is a really big deal. This is worth me investing that time whatever, your top three, whatever those things are, get some validation from others that could potentially do that financing and then go out and prove out those experiments and then go and get your first closest round because, you know, founders got to eat, right? This is like, you know, you got a mortgage or a kid or you got student loans, whatever that is, that, those are real obligations, right? So, but I, I would chart it out because at some point you got to be in the water, right? And if you're not, like, you know, the investors rightly so are like, why should I take the risk when you're, you know, one foot's on shore? Right. right. You know? So, yeah. So I would look at like, you know, your top three, validate that with some closest financiers and then try, you know, prove it out before you prove it out before you go out and uh, leave the day job. <laughs> <laughs> there's cool experiments you can run before you leave your day job that prove yeah. out those first three points, right? That's right. And, the demand gen you can figure out, right? You can do surveys for pretty cheap and still, you know, uh, you can put prototypes and stuff. You can do product hunt. I mean, there's a whole bunch of cool tools that weren't available 10 or 20 years ago that you do those first, validate that and get some commitments and then start swimming. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's really good. Yeah, and so then on the flip side, let's say you're a founder, maybe you've had an exit or, um, you know, maybe you've been working the day job and, and maybe had a, some f a founder experience in, or in the past or finance or maybe not. And you're thinking of, and you've, you've built up a little bit of savings and you're thinking about becoming a venture capitalist. Hmm. What are your advice for people who are thinking about raising a fund or thinking about courting LPs or thinking about es essentially being hired to invest in, into startups? Um, what I realized was, uh... Founders and financiers are not the same. Mm. And so if you're ready to wear a different hat and operate and think differently, that could be a good path for you. Um, I, one of the things we talked about kind of earlier was I found that the finance industry tends to be a bit more binary and founders tend to be, a, you know, they expand pie, right? They, they think collaboratively. Um, so you may have to do some mental switching between like, is this right for me? And I think the best way to talk about it is like surround yourself with some of the VC people and see if those are the right people for you um, or find a firm. If you're, if you're just like more of an operator and want to have it, find a firm that has a little bit more of that operating um, tilt to it. Like what Proto does is wonderful because you guys have a blend of that, mm. right? You want to come in and give services. You want to give advice. You want to give uh, financing. There's homes for you inside of Proto to do that. That's rare. So, you know, the, the self um, inspection first is find out who, what kind of financier you want to be, and then find out where that home, where that home would live. Just realize that they, they can be very different. It's really good. Well, so any last words, you know, the entrepreneurs, the early angel investors community, the proto community listening in, any, any, any final words, anything else we should know about Ivy or any, any, any other things that come to mind in this conversation? I promise you won't edit this out if I, if I say it. Go for it. Uh, nothing about me or Ivy. Uh, talk about you and Proto. Like watching your journey, right? And the give first mentality, extremely rare. The amount of value that's scalable that you've given out from, from content um, you know, to time that you're spending in terms of services, that's impressive. I haven't seen many do this right, like startup studios or genuinely uh, be so founder friendly and it's certainly will you've set the tone but your partners uh, everyone that i've met uh, embody that that's a tough culture to find um so more kudos to you for it and you know thanks for giving me time on the podcast to spread love for you guys man <laughs> you're you're very you're very kind uh so yeah last question where can people find you online how can they learn more about ivy 
Ivy's website is goivy.com. Um, our, our Twitter uh, and uh, Facebook are Ride Ivy. It's a whole other conversation we can talk about. Um, yeah, and, and my, my email is alex at goivy.com. I'm happy to um, help anyone uh, in their journey. Sweet. Awesome. Alex, really appreciate your time. This has been great. Thanks and be well. All right, a couple quick things before you go. Number one, I have a general newsletter where I write about technology and startups and health science and teaching people to code. And I write about a variety of different subjects that we talk about on this show. So if you go to wclittle.com, there you'll be able to subscribe and you'll also be able to subscribe to particular topics. If you're just interested in one or a few of them, you'll be notified right when I publish new content in those areas. Number two, my partners and I at Proto Ventures have a portfolio company called Startup Rocket. If you go to startuprocket.com, there you'll be able to receive coaching guides and customize an operations framework for you and your team and your advisors to be on the same page in terms of what is the appropriate next step for you and your entrepreneurial journey. And finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review anywhere that you have listened to this podcast or watched this podcast, it would be super helpful to help those who might be interested in consuming this content as well. Thank you.